This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames now have six wins in a row, and they're undefeated so far in the month of December. And as usual, I'm Dan Stevenson, alongside my co-host Matt DeBorg, and we're here to count down the week. And Matt, there's really nothing we can complain about this week with the Flames, is there? Nah, it, you know, when you're winning six games in a row and are one of the two hottest teams in the NHL, it's kind of hard to find too much to complain about. And what a difference a week makes. I mean, if you look at where we've been talking a lot, this team's been near the bottom of the West, and now we're sixth place in the West right now. Um, and if we look at the Pacific Division standings, we are right now sitting at... Uh, 34 points, which puts us third in the division, but only one point outside of first place, which is held by both Anaheim and Edmonton in a tie. So, you know, these six wins in a row have been great for the Flames. And we, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but we just got to keep this up. Yeah, well, now the Flames are basically back to square one. And you look at San Jose, they have three more games to play to hit the same amount that the Flames have played, and they're only one point back. LA has four games in hand and are four points back, so the Flames could easily slide back down to eighth place, the final wild card spot, by the time the other teams catch up. So, despite all the winning that they've been doing lately, you still have to temper some expectations just due to the fact that if they go on a losing streak, they could just find themselves falling right back to where they were. Yeah, at this point, the Flames have pretty much undone the hole they got themselves into at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, they're back to almost even hockey, if you look at it, and this six-game win streak is good. But, you know, we still know that this team is in a rebuild, and it's not, you know, I would say, based on what we saw at the beginning of the year, it's not battle-tested yet. So you're right, they could easily slip back down. And we saw that last year when they went on a seven-game winning streak in the beginning part of December, got back into things, were looking like they might have a shot at returning to the postseason, and then promptly fell back into the mediocre brand of hockey that they were playing previous to that, and then we got Matthew Kachuk. So it could happen that way again or the flames could just have turned the corner and are going to continue steamrolling the western conference well let's take a look at the last three games that the flames have put on to add the second half of this six game streak the first one was last week the flames played on the uh, 6th of december in in Dallas, and they took on the Stars. The Stars are always a team that I find the Flames play good hockey against, but it's always a close game. And in this one, we saw Johnny Goudreau continue his hot streak. He had a goal and a helper to help the Flames win 2-1 against the Stars. Um, and, you know, this is a guy who's really been putting it on since he came back from his injury. Goudreau's been looking great. Um, I don't know your thoughts on this one. I thought the first period was okay. There were the Flames had a lot more top-notch chances in the second period um, than I. Yeah, I, that I, was an embarrassing display of defense by Dallas. Yeah, Dallas's in the defense. Period. I mean, the first period they looked pretty pretty even, and I thought by the yeah. second period Dallas's defense just fell apart, and the Flames I wouldn't say played a great game, but they capitalized on that. Yeah, and like, how many times did Kari Lettinen stop Goudreau on a breakaway? Just a ridiculous amount of saves that he made, but thankfully Goudreau is finally able to break through and tie the game. Yeah, and I mean the Flames, to their credit, they did some really good challenging down the middle of the ice. If you look here, a lot of their zone entry, a lot of their neutral zone play was right down the middle. They counterattacked really well, and I thought that that threw Dallas off. I mean, anytime the Flames were counterattacking against Dallas, you just kind of saw them crumple. And in this one, I think this is finally a game, and this one we don't see very often. The Flames special teams won them this game, I think. I can agree with that. You know, Monaghan got the power play goal, which was the winner, but even outside of that, you know, if you look at it, the Flames uh, were one for two on the power play. They didn't let in any shorthanded. Um, not, a lot of, well, not a lot of penalties either way, but... 
Yeah, here's an interesting stat. In the last X number of games, I can't remember the exact cutoff, but I think it's like 10 games, the Flames actually have the best power play in the NHL. Really? Yeah. So, it's been quite the turnaround in recent weeks since the Flames were down at like 30th. Wow, that's surprising. Yeah, so the, their, their hard work and focus on that particular thing has seen some direct and immediate impact in recent weeks. And I think another game that we saw that in was looking at the uh, Coyotes game. A lot more penalty minutes in this one. The Flames took 23 minutes in the Coyotes 35, but again, the Flames went one for four on the power play, and I think that helped them win this one again. What were your thoughts on the second game of the week against the Coyotes? Boring. <laughs> Well, realistically, anytime you're playing against the Dave Tippett team, don't expect a ton of excitement. No, but, but I thought the good thing was we, we usually struggle against the Coyotes, and we finally pulled out two points against them. Yeah, well, it's the second time that they've had a 2-1 overtime win against them this season. And the first goal, they got a little scrambly after the power play ended, uh, and that's how they scored their only goal of the contest, and... It was just a relentless effort by Calgary to get back into it. It was a nice feed from Gaudreau to Giordano for the equalizer and then Giordano to Hamilton for the game winner. I think to me when you're playing against Dave Tippett team, it's about patience and it's about can they crack you before you crack. And in this case, yeah. from I didn't see the whole game, but from what I saw of this game, the Flames were really able to sort of match the Coyotes, slow down with the Coyotes, and outthink the Coyotes to get the win. Yeah, well, Phoenix is, or Arizona is has always been a counterpunch type team since Tippett came aboard, and they're just waiting for you to make a mistake, and then they're going to pounce on it. And the Flames were patient enough to limit them from doing much of anything, and eventually find that opening especially in overtime to pot one and get the two points i was surprised in this game how many penalty minutes both teams had like this one i think both teams kind of got sick of playing defensive hockey after a while and they started going after each other yeah they were getting a little frustrated and that fight between hathaway and domi was an interesting one wasn't it well, uh, you know, Domi getting hurt for a couple, like six weeks, eight weeks, something like that. You know, he as as a player has to learn that if somebody hits you, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he has a reputation if he gets hit what he deems as a late hit, he just attacks the other guy. And But his dad was a bit of the same way. Yeah, but... It's not going to help, especially because he's a scoring type player. That's not going to help him moving forward, especially like into when Arizona actually competes in the playoffs. Because all you have to do to get him off his game is piss him off, and then he's going to do something stupid. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right there, and he's still young. I think it'll be really interesting to see how he rebounds, like how his, I guess, his hockey smarts in that area improve over the years. It's sort of like Sam Bennett, I think. There's a lot of room that he needs to improve on just hockey smarts and ice savvy-wise. Yeah. And I think both has, guys have all he, the tools. He could, yeah, like he could be a player that is a similar generic type as a Ginla was where, you know, he can drop the gloves, but he, he a Ginla, he'd pick his spots and he, it's not like he'd dro just drop his gloves with anybody. It, so Domi will have to learn how to pick his spots better and not react to every little thing. For sure. Well, let's move on from the boring game to the most exciting game of the week. The Calgary Flames take on their Western Canadian rival. And, you know, it's still weird for me to see Winnipeg Jets on the marquee. But the Flames took on the Winnipeg Jets and ended up winning this one. Another big win for the Flames on this uh, this winning streak with a 6-2 win over the Jets. Uh, Matt, I have a whole bunch of comments on this game, but 
Um, I don't know about you. When I heard that Hutchinson was going to be starting, I thought the Flames might be in trouble because I think that Hutchinson's generally the better of their two goalies. Yeah, I I haven't really been too impressed with any of the goaltending that Winnipeg has had since they've come back to the Jets. So, uh, yeah, uh, they're okay. Did you have any games but... that you liked before they came back to the Jets and they were Atlanta? Uh, Carl Ettenen could play well. It, yeah, he was in team wildly in train wreck. Yeah, true, but for specifically the goaltenders, Lettinen was okay. Uh, sometimes, just you never knew what you're gonna get. He was either gonna be an eight or nine out of ten, or a four out of ten, and you don't know until the puck drops. Very inconsistent. Yeah, and we see that with Dallas. Like it, he was having one of his good games against us earlier in the week. And yet in other games, uh, he's a sieve, so just depends. But uh, Winnipeg's goalies, they're all kind of just there, and they'll have to fix that moving forward. I think that this game was more about Winnipeg playing poorly than Calgary playing really great. Yeah, and Calgary, especially because uh, Winnipeg's a... a for checking team and that's how they generate their offense is getting a whole bunch of forwards into the play the defenders made an adjustment where they were would chip the puck off the boards off the glass or up in the air over the on rushing forwards and that would lead to odd man rushes headed back the other way and while it took a while for them to break through and actually score a goal, once they did, it was just game over. And I, I got to talk to Coach uh, Glenn Gullitson after the game, and one of the things that he said at that time was that one of the reasons we succeeded is we moved as a five-man unit. And he was right. I mean, for the first time I can remember, every time we were in the offensive zone almost, there was somebody in front of the net. There was always defensemen where they needed to be. Like, everybody was where they need to be most of the night, and that's why good things happened. Yeah, Calgary is starting to actually play like the team that they look like they could be on paper prior to the season starting. Um, the Flames, I thought, had a number of good shots in the first, but it was really Hutchinson keeping his team in. I thought that after the first period, if you looked, both teams were pretty even. The second period's where the Flames really took over. That Dougie Hamilton goal, I thought, was pretty similar to the uh, the game before when he scored the overtime winner. And the the Jets had some some interesting bounces, some really unlucky bounces. Like they had one that went off Johnson, I thought was going to go in and didn't. And the Flames were able to capitalize on that. the uh, The Bennett goal, the second goal, was pretty much the, the exact same goal as the Hamilton one earlier. And I think that the Flames just kind of overwhelmed the Jets here. The Jets just didn't know what to do after a while. And the Flames really took over on the ice. It's nice to see. It was nice to see that uh, the day before his 19th birthday, Matthew Kachuk got three assists to bump him up to nine on the season. Yeah, we uh, I, I got a chance to speak with Kachuk after the game, and uh, he was saying how you know it was a great way to celebrate his birthday, and he was glad to have a few days off. So I would imagine that was a very interesting birthday celebration. Yeah. Were you surprised that the that the Jets changed goalies in the third? I mean, to me, it, was, no. it wasn't the goalie's fault. The entire team was playing terrible. Well, that sometimes you pull the goalie because he's playing badly. And then sometimes you pull them because the team is playing badly. And the Jets just were completely lifeless. And I can understand why the coaching staff was trying to do something to get them going. But it didn't take long for Boma to score his first of the season in the third period. And then it was just a matter of waiting for the clock to tick down at that point i thought that in the third period of this game as well we really saw what i would call calgary flame style hockey the new calgary flame style hockey in the third period they played the way that glenn gullitson wanted them to play and you could tell they were up they were in good spirits and they were all kind of playing the game they wanted they weren't scrambling they weren't trying to chase a lead it was really i think the best period of looking at what this team's supposed to look like yeah and one of the things that I've noticed in recent games, especially since they've gone on this winning streak, is that they're surrendering very few goals that are not coming off of defensive scrambles or odd man rushes. Like, no 
very few just clean shots are going in the net. It's usually if the Flames defenders get running around in their own zone for a minute or something like that, or like Nikolai Ehlers' goal, where it was a odd man two-on-one situation. It seems like that's the only way that teams have been able to score lately against Calgary. Yeah, no, for sure. Which, that's a good thing because of the fact that if your defense is able to pressure the puck carrier, it forces them to have to make quick decisions, and the more you are attacking them the more prone they are to screw up and turn the puck over to you and then your forwards are on their way and you know it's part of the reason why the flames are winning a lot lately and you were mentioning the special teams earlier great to see the flames uh getting two power play goals in this one the monahan and the backland goals both came with the man advantage so that's that's really what we need to be seeing if this team is going to be successful they need to be scoring in all situations, shorthanded power plays and special teams. And not just scoring, but not giving up all of the uh, power play goals either, which they've done very well this week. Yeah, they did allow the one to Ehlers, but that was just because everybody was a little bit over-enthusiastic on the penalty kill trying to get a sixth goal. So it happens, which I'm sure that they were given a talking to after that, but... Such is life. It's not a big deal when you're up by five. So looking at this game, and I think looking at most of the games this week, we've seen one player really in my mind emerge, and that's Dougie Hamilton. Dougie's had a fantastic week. He had uh, you know, two goals in the last game. He had a goal the game before. Hamilton really came into the season, if you think about it, slotted in as the, as the third defenseman. He was number three on the depth chart behind Brody and, and uh, Giordano. But he, if you look, he currently leads the Flames defenseman in just about every category you can name. Goals, points, relative possession, relative scoring chances. And if you if you look at you know the kind of progression of players this year, he's doing really well, and Brody's kind of struggling. And I think it's awesome that we're starting to see. It's taken him longer than we wanted, but to me, I think that we're starting to really see what we've got in Dougie Hamilton now. Yeah, and he's tied for 11th in the NHL in points for defensemen. And second in team scoring. Yeah, and he's only two points behind fourth overall amongst defensemen. So it's very encouraging to see him emerge. I think that, like, I, I know that some people were, like, disappointed at times with him because he hasn't been pitcher perfect, but... Again, he's only, like, what, 22, 23 years old? 23. So, like, you know, (laughs) most young defensemen aren't even in the NHL and playing significant minutes by the age of 23, let alone being in the top 11 amongst all NHL defensemen in points. And I'm not trying to say that he's going to be the new number two, but I think that we're really seeing Dougie Hamilton emerge with a style of play. His defensive style is becoming very evident. He's becoming a lot more offensive than we've seen. I mean, both the game that he scored against Minnesota and the first goal against the Jets, he was way in the forward zone. Like, you know, I was surprised when I saw who scored them because I'm like, wow, Hamilton's way up there. So we're really, I think, starting to see him get an identity. Last year he seemed like a kind of generic defenseman to me, and I'm really enjoying watching him play this year. Yeah, and he's on pace to eclipse his uh, career season from a year ago by a whole two points, which that's also encouraging, and we'll see how he does, but he's looking more and more like a number one defenseman in the NHL, and that's just a good thing for Calgary, because you know that TJ Brody is struggling this year, but that's not going to last. He's too good of a player for the, those struggles to last forever. Yeah, and, G- and Gio's also aging, right? So at some point we need to look at a succession plan for him, and I'm feeling more confident about Hamilton being that number two guy in the long term after seeing how he's come around this week. Exactly. I did get a chance to speak with Dougie after the game in the Flames locker room, and I asked him a question. Um, if you look at when he started really turning the Jets on and how it corresponds to Brian Burke's comments about some idiot GM leaking news of a trade, 
Um, and were the two things correlated? And of course, Dougie says they're not, but I have to think that it has something to do with it, trying to prove his worth to the Flames now. I could see it. Uh, anytime you get that much confidence from your management, that it does nothing but give you confidence. So I'm sure that he a little bit of it is from that, but he's always been a very good offensive defenseman, so could be coincidental, but I tend to agree with you. So I think, you know, of all the Flames, especially over this last winning streak that have really looked good, I'd say that Hamilton has been, I think, the one that's emerged the most. Can you think of anyone else that's really stood out over these last six games? It wasn't I'm going to have to go... I'm going to have to go with Sam Bennett. I think his hot streak's been a little bit longer than that, but he is starting to show, like, what his potential is. And he had a bit of a rocky start to the season, the first 15 or so games. He wasn't very good, but ever since then, he's been probably the Flames' second or third best forward and I think the only one that you could really say, the only two guys that you could say are better is uh, Monahan and Goudreau. So it's nice to see, and I'm hoping that he continues to have his excellent play moving forward. See, I would have to disagree a little bit on Bennett. I think that he's still giving up too many giveaways and taking too many dumb penalties. Yeah, well, the dumb penalties are with him are going to happen and that is a learning process but just he has to show that he can be a 50 or 60 point player and he hasn't up to this point in his career so it's just good to see him starting to contribute like he should be able to for sure so Matt, we uh, we are on this five zero and zero record in December. We're undefeated this month. Hopefully that carries on. The franchise record right now is eleven home game winning streaks. So these are home and away. But it would be nice if we could even string together eleven in a row. Period. Um, if you look, we've talked about this. We're at the bottom of the league to start with, and now we're you know racing for number one in our division. So in your mind. How do we get here? What has changed with this hockey team since the beginning of the year? Nothing. They learned the system. That's it. I I think you're right. I think it's just guys learning the system. I think it's guys being comfortable in their roles. And, you know, we're finally starting to see all the top offensive guys turn it on. I mean, for the first part of the season, Goudreau wasn't scoring. Monaghan wasn't scoring, and we we're really getting all of our points from the bottom nine forwards. And we said, and we've said it a few times, that once the top three got going, this team could only get better. I mean, look at the team winning when Johnny was injured, and now he's back. So I think you're right. It's just everyone understanding their role and understanding how this thing's going to roll together. Yeah, well, you have to remember that it, when it comes to the NHL, you have, like, zero reaction time. And learning a new system, it doesn't become automatic right away. And the team, it takes a little while to get things from being, I should do this, to just doing it. And that little hesitation there is what caused so many of the problems that the team had in the first, well, what, 15, 18 I'd say games? probably first 20 games. Yeah. So once they got that in everything down instinctually, it, now they're not having those huge defensive lapses like we saw when Elliot was in net and he'd make the first two saves, but nobody would be there for the third one. And like I know Elliot's been pretty much given a raw deal to this point, but you know we'll carry on with that conversation in a little while. But now that the team is working cohesively as a unit, it makes Johnson's job a lot easier, and he's taken it and run with it as well. Well, let's talk about that, because I think the goaltending has been a big part of this. So Chad Johnson came into the season as the backup. 
He's now started 10 of the last 12 games for the Flames and posted a 9-1-0 record. And he started all five games of the current five-game winning streak. Over those last 12 games, he has a trio of shutouts of 9.54 save percent and a 1.57 goals against average. He's also only allowed one goal or less seven times. And after the win against uh, the Phoenix Coyotes, when I pulled these stats, he's now seventh in the NHL for wins, goals against average, and save percent. So to me, I really think that, and I don't want to compare him to Kippersoff, but I think he's doing for this team what Kipper did when he first came in. He's the backup who's going on a run and taking the team on his back, and everyone's rallying behind him. Yeah, he's just very steady. Like, there's no flashiness to his game like Kipper did. But he's just very calm, very composed, gets in front of the puck, stops him, and that's it. And that's what the Flames need, is just goaltending that can actually stop the puck and not allow any weak goals and most of the goals that he has surrendered recently have been quality efforts from the other team so nothing to complain about it'll be interesting to see moving forward how brian elliott responds once he gets back in the net yeah i mean there's been some games where i think johnson has won us the game no doubt I think there's been a lot of games where the team has won the game and Johnson hasn't had a lot of work. I'd say that, you know, there's been a few of those lately, especially. Yeah, like the Anaheim game or the Jets exactly. game. Well, yeah, the Jets game, we got some work early on. But, yeah, I agree with you. And I think that overall this team is just feeling comfortable playing in front of them. And that's really what you need. And, I mean, you know, we've seen with the Flames in the past when we put in whoever the random goaltender backing up Kipper was, especially guys like McElhaney, the team has never played well in front of them. So, you know, if Johnson's the man, then it's good that we've got him there. And I think the Flames made a wise choice by going with two pretty established NHL goalies this year because it is giving us these options. And I agree with you what you said earlier. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Brian Elliott and how he responds when he's finally put back in the net. Yeah, and heading into this offseason, the Flames had the opportunity to acquire two goaltenders that were of in the top five in terms of save percentage over the X num- last few years, I think last four or five years. So getting two guys that are good is unfortunately for Elliot, he was put in for most of the games when the team was struggling and hasn't really had an opportunity since. But he will. So we'll see like once the like, I, I know we play a back-to-back later, well, the ne- this time next week, against Arizona and San and Jose. Yep. So, uh, I'm sure he'll get one of those games, and we can see how he's doing at that point. And, you know, if you look at the stats of the guys over time, I mean, since... And, obviously, Elliot's older and has had a bit larger portfolio of work. He's one year older. Uh, Brian Elliott's 31, and Chad Johnson is 30. But Elliot has the better stats on paper. If you were going to re-sign one of them based on their stats and their history, you go with Elliot. But if you were in charge of the Flames team right now and you had to re-sign one of these goalies for next year, because right now they're both on a one-year deal, who would you re-sign, Matt? I'm actually going to do a little cop-out and say I'd actually re-sign both. You think you can afford them both? Yeah. I think... uh, Elliot would probably be in the four million dollar range, and uh, Chad Johnson probably in the three and a half million dollar range. So seven for two goalies, I don't see that being a problem, and see how it goes. Because I, I, how would you say it? Like I, I like how John Gillies is playing, but he could likely use another year and he's still waiver eligible next year. So we don't have to worry about him waiver being exempt. parked and st- yeah, that's what I meant. So we don't have to worry about him getting picked off waivers next year. And I mean, the so fact sign, that he lost sign year, one of them. He needs one more yeah. year. Yeah. Sign one of them to a one year deal and then sign the other guy to a multi-year deal, but don't be in a rush to sign either of them, but have that flexibility open. Cause you can't, like, obviously, if you signed one of them to a multi-year deal right now, it'd be Johnson. But, you know, we haven't seen what Elliot and how he responds, so let's wait and see how each of them does and make up your mind, say, in March or April 
on that front. And you have to remember that, you know, yes, Johnson's hot right now, but there's no indication based on this past that he's the next Carey Price or, you know, Henrik Ludvisk. So we have to pay him accordingly. I mean, look at the top goalies in the league. They're making seven, eight, nine million dollars. And so yeah, I think if we could get both of them back here for, you know, seven million, that's a good tandem. And it would be unfortunate, I think, to pay Elliot if the season continues the way it is to pay him more, but I think that's the way it would end up being. Yeah. Well, if Elliot continues to post stats like he has, then of course you don't re-sign him. That's only if he bounces back, which I'm is what I'm expecting him yeah, to. Yeah, I, I think now because the a- team, it's not the same team that he was playing in front. No, of. it's not. And and I mean, he wasn't the only guy that was good before. So I think now the team is doing well. Elliot's going to do well next time he sees the net. I don't necessarily think he'll be the go- goalie going forward, but I think that he's going to look just as good. Yeah, and you got to remember the two games that he started recently against Buffalo and New York, he lost both, but the Buffalo game was not his fault. The team just absolutely collapsed in the middle period with all those stupid penalties one right after another. And the Islanders game, he got the team to overtime, and a deflection goal in overtime is what sunk him there. Not much you can do. So uh, he looks solid in each of the games that he's played since the team's been playing better. It's just when you got Johnson going 9-1, and one, you're like, eh, you can just stay in the net until you suck or do terribly. Watch it. Keep him going. So, ride the hot streak as long as you can. Yeah, because, you know, you don't, especially after the Flames have this three-day break between games i'm interested to see how johnson responds against tampa bay if he struggles then you might see elliot versus columbus but we'll see and that's an interesting too that you're mentioning about the three-day break if you look at the flame schedule so far really they've been playing hockey every other day for the most part of the season if you average it all out and i think that part of the reason this team got down early is they were just getting tired i think that they were playing too much hockey they didn't have a chance to try their new system they'd get frustrated and they were playing all elite teams That's true. by and large and i think that they would get you know they'd probably watch video and do cuz you don't have a full practice generally on game days so i think they would get frustrated and the frustration would just kind of roll over from one game to the next until they had some time to reset it and I think we're seeing a few more breaks now. You know, day, a couple days here and there. The Flames right now have a three-day break. They have a couple two-day breaks later in the month. So I think just some of that mental rest is going to help the team out. Yeah, and like the Flames that from uh, the second weekend of the season on the 22nd uh, right through till uh, the – Arizona game on November 16th they played a dozen games against teams that are all in the playoffs and up in the upper portion of the playoff standings so it, not exactly the, the most easy stretch when you're trying to figure out a new system <laughs> here go beat you know Chicago and St. Louis and Washington you know it's just not fair so <laughs> You know, it, now that the Flames are playing teams that are more evenly spread out through the standings, the team's more able to implement their game. For sure, and you have to be able to beat those teams. But like you said, they have to come in moderation. you got to have a couple teams that are lower in the standings than a good team, then a couple lower teams than a good team again. Yeah, sort of like how we played Toronto, and then we got uh, Minnesota, and then Anaheim. And then... a a few easy games and then we're going to be playing Tampa and Columbus who are both doing well. Well, Tampa not so much, but Columbus and it j- just makes it a little more balanced instead of murderer's row. So, you know, looking forward at the season then, we have this great six-game win streak that we're on. What do you think the Flames have to either change or continue doing in order to keep this win streak up? realistically they need to just keep focusing on the details because when the team gets away from themselves and start doing things sloppily in their own zone that's when they give up goals or if they are careless at the offensive blue line odd man rush the other way puck ends up in the net 
So just keep focusing on those details and just keep doing what they're doing when the other team actually has control of the puck in our zone. Just to limit... Because the Flames have three lines that are quality lines, so they have enough talent where they're, they're fine. It's just attention to details. I think the fact... One of the things I think if I've been looking lately... Um, the fact the Flames have kind of steadied their lines has helped. We always had kind of the, you know, the Backland, Kachuk, Froelich line that was doing really well, and now we've seen them playing with other guys, and I think we finally stabilized those lines. We know who's playing where, we know who's with who, and they can start to build that chemistry. And I think that's going to be a big thing going forward is just to keep the lines as static as you can um, you know, you're going to have to move guys in and out once in a while, but keep those lines static and keep that chemistry building. And they've tried moving Monaghan and Goudreau apart and back together, and I think we're seeing that they're working as we thought they would the best together. So putting those guys together, getting everyone clicking on one page, I think this team just needed time to get ready. I agree. And especially, like, as this team leaves the rebuild, they need to have that depth so that you can just roll the lines and have dangerous threats all through your lineup because even the best teams only usually have four defensemen that are good and then filler guys like Yoki Paka and Kulak and that type of thing so you're going to be facing the other team's weaker defensemen with a good line if you have that talent spread out and it might not be the Goudreau line that gets it done. It might be the Kachuk line. Or it could be the Monaghan line. So it helps we've, just to have that spread. We've set ourselves up to have a deep forward roster that can score. I mean, I think we can get production easily from all three of the top forward lines. So I think that's going to be a big key, too, is to make sure that everybody's contributing offensively. Yeah, and then have the fourth line be the thumper line where it makes the other team black and blue whenever you send them and out there. And we've already seen that with guys like Hathaway out on the ice, and you know he's really played that role so well this week. Oh, I know. He's quickly becoming a fan favorite. He is. And, but, I mean, that usually happens with that guy, right? We saw it with Furland, we saw it with McGratton, we saw it with you know uh, Christoph Oliwas, Chris Simon. That role is usually yeah. a fan favorite. Yeah, I can't. Remember. It's good having pain in the ass players. I can't remember the last time we had a tough guy people hated. No, true. So Matt, looking at some of the other topics this week, I guess the biggest uh, Flames roster news we've seen some players come and go from the roster over the last couple of weeks with Shin Carrick getting sent down and Jankowski getting sent back down to Stockton. This is one that confused a lot of people, and that Brett Kulak was sent back to Stockton, and Tyler Watherspoon was recalled from Stockton to Calgary. He didn't play against Winnipeg, but he's on the roster, which meant the Flames put Yerky Okipaka back in. To me, when I look at this move, I think that there's only one reason the Flames did it, and it's because Oliver Shillington is going to be gone for about a month. He's been selected to the uh, selection camp for Sweden's World Junior Team, which to me there's no doubt he's going to make. So you want to send Kulak back to Stockton, get him back into the system there, get him playing in Stockton, and he'll be filling in and getting a lot of ice time in Stockton during that month. And Watherspoon, as we know, well, he's a serviceable NHL number seven. So you bring him in and you let him ride in the press box until he's ready to go. And to me, there's no rush to get Watherspoon on the on the ice. What do you think of this move? Uh, yeah, I think it's a perfectly viable move. Um, you need... Kulak has been just sitting in the press box and that's not really doing him any favors. So Watherspoon, as we've mentioned before, his Flames career is likely coming to an end at the end of the season. So, uh, you know, it, if he just sits in the press box, that's fine. If not, it, he's decent, but he's just there. So... Allows Kulak to get some prime ice time in Stockton. So it's a win-win. And Kulak, I'm sure, once Shillington is back, will get recalled back to Calgary. Oh yeah, I have no doubt that uh, Kulak will be back. There's just a good time for him to get a ton of ice time playing down in the AHL that he wouldn't get in the NHL. 
It's interesting with Tyler Watherspoon. I mean, if you look at him, he was really the only defensive prospect we had for a while. If we needed to call someone up, we brought him up. It was really him and nobody else. I mean, him and Mark Kandari were, I think, the best defensemen we had for a while in the system. And now we've had guys that have leapfrogged him in the depth chart. And I, uh, you and I have talked about this, and I agree with you, that I think this is Watherspoon's last season with the Flames. I don't see him being recalled. I don't see another NHL team probably taking him on after this. I think there's a lot of those kind of guys in his role who have better performance, who you'd bring in as that number seven or veteran farm team guy. And, you know, I hate to say it, but Watherspoon, I don't think, has risen to the challenge. No, and when you're evaluating prospects you ha- on a year-to-year basis, you have to see some progression in their game. And once they plateau... Like, you give them another opportunity, and the Flames have, to like, okay, let's go, and the, he hasn't responded. And like a guy like, say, Keegan Kanzig, who's been maligned at times, each year with him, you are seeing that progression, Maybe and while he still has a way to go, you're still seeing that, though. Like, he hasn't plateaued as a player yet, so... But Watherspoon seems to have, and yeah, he's it, he is what he is, a number seven, number eight type player. I, he might get another contract with somebody else, but I don't see the Flames needing him to play. No. And especially with a guy like Hickey likely ready for the AHL and Olus Matson probably coming over next year there are going to be spots needed to open up in Stockton for them to play, and he's just the odd man out. I don't think that he's worth much either on the trade market, but I can see him no, being included he, in a deal later in the year. Yeah, it would be like the Reinhardt or Freddie Hamilton trade, where like if he, he plays X number of games in the NHL, then you get a late round pick. Yeah, I could even see him usually being wrapped those up with don't... something else, like Dennis Weidman and Tyler Watherspoon for something. Yeah, I could see that. Or a pick plus him for a rental if the Flames go that route. Yeah, that would work too. Is yeah, him and a few other pieces for a rental because he's really a rental as he is. But you know, it's kind of too bad because yeah, we just haven't seen the progression from Watherspoon, and I think he was a good. You know, he was a 50, number 57 overall draft pick, second round for the Flames in 2011. He had some potential when he was drafted, but he's 23, and, you know, 23 is still young, but as a 23-year-old, he should be progressing, and he's just not. He's, he's plateaued. Yeah. Uh, it's frustrating, but that's why, as a rebuilding team, you need as many high-end draft picks as possible so that way, if guys do not turn out, you have other guys that can surprise and develop instead. And like a guy like Kulak, uh, coming out as a fourth round pick, has supplanted him as the number seven. And Kulak's and... a surprise there too. I mean, we never would have expected him, you know, two years ago to be the the one guy from that sort of older core of defensemen that probably made the the Flames roster on a regular basis. No. And he but has risen that's that occasion. Why you need, yeah, well, that's why you need as deep of a pool as you can get because some guys will disappoint, like Berchi did. Some guys will surprise, like Gaudreau did. So it, it all evens out, but the more you have, the better off you are. Let's talk about a couple former Flames here. Um, just a note. On a former Flame, not that he's coming back here, but Josh Juris put on waivers this year. Uh, he was just placed on waivers, and he actually got picked up. He was on waivers and got picked up by the Phoenix Coyotes. And I was also looking around to former Flames. Joe Colborn signed a big deal in the offseason. He's struggling this year. I mean, to be fair, so is the whole Colorado team. But you have to think that Brad Living's looking a bit smarter now for not re-signing Colborn and not signing the the big deal that he wanted and to let Juris walk. Well, Juris was a good player up until he hurt his wrist, and he has never been the same since. 
I mean, he was a good story two years ago when we had the motto, always earn, never given. This was a guy who was signed to be a fourth-line AHL guy, so you know, moved quickly up the ranks and got a full-time NHL job. And it really showed that, you know, always earn, never given mentality the team wanted. And you're right, he he never really was the same after the wrist injury. But even without that, I think he'd still be a marginal fourth-line player. Yeah, probably, but not waiver wire material for sure. No, and and Phoenix of all teams, I think it makes sense for them to take a chance on him. Oh yeah, well when you're twenty or two years away from the season that he had, and Arizona being Arizona, like you can just throw him in and see if he can figure it out again. And what do you think about, I mean, we were kind of disappointed, both of us, a little bit when Colborne got let go, but looking at his season in Colorado now, how do you feel about the Flames letting him go for the money he ended up signing for? Well, honestly, I, if Colborne was in Calgary, I don't think he'd be having as bad of a season. No, I mean, the whole team is struggling in Colorado. To yeah, there. you look at some of the the players that he's playing with, and... I think that, like, the fourth-line guys in Stockton are better than those guys. So, you know, it's... It, Colborne has never been a player that will generate a ton of offense by himself. Like, he knows how to get into the positions to score, but he, you know, usually you find him banging home pucks from in front of the net. And if he doesn't have somebody that can feed him the puck he's not going to produce for you. So I think that if he was in Calgary, he'd probably have 12 or 13 points instead of what he does. But that was his decision to go there, and now he's looking like a fringe NHLer and probably will end up screwing his career up a bit. Well, even at 12, 14 points, he's expensive. You know, I mean, he signed a rich deal in Colorado, and I don't blame him. Good for him for chasing the money while he can get it. We always he want these Well, he actually took less to play in Colorado than what the Flames were offering him. Yeah, but, I mean, better than last year. Um, he got True. He got a raise over last year. He reportedly what the Flames were offering him, yeah. but um, And good for him. You know, he went where he thought he needed to go, and it's too bad his season won't work out there, but he's got a few years, and hopefully he'll rebound next year. But... I'm just glad now that, yeah, what the Flames were talking about offering him, which I think was, what, four for four? Uh, something like that, three and a quarter, three yeah. and a half per, something like that. So I'm glad that we didn't do that now. I think that money has been better spent. Yeah, and realistically, Alex Chason has more or less filled that role. He's not as good offensively, but the production has been there. Yeah, and I think that Garnet Hathaway has filled some of that tough guy role that Colborne tried to fill, but I don't think ever did it very well, and Hathaway is doing it much better. Yeah. Well, Colborne's never been anything more than a finesse player, really. No, and actually, if you, despite his size. If you look at his play style and everything, I think, honestly, the guy that replaced him is probably Kachuk. Yeah. Kachuk's a better offensive player, but he's sort of playing that gritty style that Colborne tried to play and I don't think was ever all that good at. The last former Flames news here, and this is an interesting one you and I have talked about before, there's rumors coming out of Colorado that Jerome Aginla is considering waiving his no-movement clause of the trade deadline. Jerome's 39, he's definitely declined, but he's never won a Stanley Cup, and he's been around a long time, good player. A um, lot of talk this week about should the Flames reacquire him at the deadline if he'd even want to go back to Calgary. And you know me, Matt, we've talked about this. I have mixed emotion on this. I like Jerome McGinley as a person. I like him as a player. I understand why they had to move him to start a new area here in Calgary. But we need, I don't know, to me, I don't like the Forever Flames thing. I don't like all these guys that have been honored, that have not been around I think we sort of need that retirement here in Calgary, and I think it would be a great story to bring Jerome back for nothing or for Watherspoon or, you know, something cheap at the deadline. Let him play 20 games on the third line, retire, and then raise number 12 after that. But at the same time, if he wants to go for a Stanley Cup contender, let's be honest, the Flames are not this year. You know, they might make the... I'm not going to agree with you there, but... But if you're 39 and you've maybe got one more shot, do you go with Calgary? 
to get well, that shot? Well, you also have to look at uh, other teams and how many teams need a right winger. Like, Calgary desperately needs a right winger. Yeah, so, I don't know that Jerome McGinley is going to help them all that much in the long term. No, but if you play him on a depth roll and like just shove him out on the power play so Gaudreau can feed him pucks for one-timers, it could fit. Yeah, we see a lot of teams that overpay for that same depth veteran guy at the deadline, though, so I would not be surprised if there's a market for him outside of us. Yeah, but... I wouldn't pay a lot. No, for but uh, him. but I mean, some you know, it's not like there's nobody that would want him, even if they don't need right wingers. Teams are always looking for veteran depth going into the postseason. Yeah, something like say Boma Pollock and Watherspoon, and maybe a, like a fourth or something like that would do the. I trick. wouldn't even give up that much for him. I don't think I don't think he's good enough to play. I don't know how much longer his contract is, but I don't think he's... This year. Okay, so I, don't, I wouldn't give up that much for a rental who's declining and having not a great year this year. I think that would be a lot. I think you yeah. would... I mean, Colorado's not going to the playoffs, let's be honest. No. So I think you'd almost make a deal for, like, a seventh-round pick. It's more of a symbolic deal at that point with Colorado or give him Watherspoon or something like that. But wh- yeah. what would your well, thoughts like be a- about seeing number 12 back in a Flames jersey? I'd be fine with that. And I've not, I've never really been the the biggest Aginla fan, but in terms of need and acquisition cost, his your deal's up at the end of the year, and he's thirty nine. It's not going to cost an arm and a leg. And I honestly don't think he'll get another one after this. Yeah, he might. It depends. He's always been a slow starter as well, and so the fact that he's struggling to begin the year, it's like, uh, okay, that's kind of normal for him. So he's always been a second half type of guy. So if he, I think Jerome can might come, come in, might come back next year if he can get a deal with a team that's probably going to be a contender. Otherwise, I think you just hang him up. Yeah. And that's where, like, a team like Calgary may make some sense in that regard as well if he wanted to come back for next season. If you, say, like, a one-year at, like, three million and basically be the Yager-type player, the, you know, third-line right-winger can throw him out on the power play just to shoot the puck, it could be a viable option. And I think that, you know, as much as we're over the Jerome McGinley era, I think the thing fans have to remember, if this does happen, we're not bringing Jerome back to be the top right winger on the first line with Monaghan and Goudreau. I'm not saying they wouldn't try it, but he's really coming back to be veteran depth. He's the, the Craig Conroy of this roster. Yeah, you would, I wouldn't be shocked if they'd, say, subbed out Chase on from the Bennett line and put McGinley in if that was the case with Gaudreau. Yeah, and I could see them even putting, you know, Gaudreau, um, Monaghan, maybe, and Iggy on the power play together a few times. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I would expect Aginla to still be on the first power play unit just so he can fire the one-timer. And I, but... and I think that's such cool symbolism, too, to sort of have the last generation and the new generation playing together. Yeah, and it's the same feeling that I'm sure a lot of Flames fans had with Theo Fleury when he tried to come back as well. Well, you so. remember the great story behind that. I mean, the whole city was behind the guy, and this is a, b- a little bit different. I mean, Jerome hasn't gone through, I think, the same love-hate relationship with the Flames organization that Theo has. But, yeah, it's a great Flame trying to come back, and I think it would be I think it'd be a great story if he comes back. I think, I don't know, I think it only works if he's going to retire at the end of the year, just because then the, the story goes full circle. Otherwise, I'm not sure it's worth doing. Yeah. Well, it also depends if he's willing to come back on a cheap contract for next year as well. Because, like, if you're only paying him, like, three million bucks or something like that for a one-year deal for next season, like, that's not a big deal. Yeah. Like, it's not hard to fill, fit that in. No, I mean, that you could do, but I just don't think you can come make a deadline deal in Calgary, play here for 20 games, and then go to... No, and I, d- I wouldn't see him doing that No, I think if, if it's going to happen, you know that he's ending his career in Calgary, whether it's this year or next year. I personally don't think I'd sign him next year, but I, I think... I- it, it would be an option, and you'd be able to see how he responds in the 20 games or whatever. 
as well. Yeah, I just think it's a cool symbolism, and I would love to see it just as a Flames fan and as an Aginla fan. I think it would just be a really neat thing to do, and and I can see yeah. people in the dome and being really emotional when he gives that final salute in the last home game. Yeah, and it's one of those situations that, like, if it wasn't for the fact that the Flames' right wing depth is abysmal, that then like if it he, say he's a left winger, then no, we wouldn't need him. But the fact that the Flames' two right wingers are Brower and Froelich, who are not exactly goal scorers, and then you've got Chason and Hathaway. Like, that, you need some offensive firepower there, and if the Flames are in a playoff spot or close come the deadline, it does make some so sense. So let us know, guys. Um, I know that everyone has a thought on Jerome Aginla, and I know some of our fans are probably going to be polar opposites and say, don't bring Jerome in. Let us know. Either get a hold of us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're at fire or we're Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Or if you go to our website, FiresideChat.ca, you can use the contact link at the top or on the right-hand side of any page, there's a join the conversation link, and that lets you use your computer to leave us a voicemail. So let us know what you think. Let us know if you think that bringing number 12 back for one last run in the Flaming Sea is a good idea or if it's a terrible idea. And we want to know what everyone thinks because I think we're going to be all very opposite on this. I like Jerome. I think he's still got some gas left in the tank. And as long as the acquisition cost works, I think Matt and I would both do it. But let's hear your thoughts. It's too bad we still we should almost sign Agostino and Hanowski again just to trade them away for Jerome. <laughs> that, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah. Well, Matt, let's look ahead at the next week of Flames hockey. We've been having a great December so far, and the Flames have four games between now and our next show, which will be on the 21st of December. Uh, Two of those are at home. Two of those are on the road. So the next two games are Wednesday the 14th against Tampa Bay Lightning and Friday the 16th against the Columbus Blue Jackets, both of the Dome. You can get tickets for those from our friends at TickTix. Install it on your Android or iOS app, and you're guaranteed to get tickets from season ticket holders. They're all vetted, and there's no... You don't have to meet someone in a shady alley. It's all done digitally, which is awesome. And then on the 19th and 20th, we have back-to-back games against the Arizona Coyotes and the San Jose Sharks. So looking at those games, uh, eight points on the table. Looking back at last week's predictions, we had six points. The Flames got all six, and I predicted they'd get all wins. You were a little less optimistic and thought we'd only get two against Dallas. Yeah, well, I can't complain. So no, so with that, I take the season lead uh, four to one, and I've already put my predictions in for this Let's week. Go ahead. Of the eight points on the table, I think the Flames will get six of them. I think the run will continue right up till the end of the twentieth, and I think we'll lose the back to back to San Jose. I think these are going to be tough games, and the Flames are going to look a bit tired by the time we get to San Jose. I'm gonna go with six points as well but I'm going to opt uh, to say that Columbus is the game that they'll lose wonderful the game I'm going to and you're saying I get to go see a loss yeah pretty much why do you think Columbus they've been very good this season they're I think fourth in the NHL right now in points and uh, their only loss recently was oddly enough to us so they're a very dangerous team. They gave the Flames a hard time in that game, and it was Johnson frustrating them more than. See, anything. that's one of those. That's one of those games. I think where we really get to see if this Flames team can hold up to a good NHL team. Yeah. Tampa's faltering a little bit this year. Yeah, they're Columbus, good, but they're not this year for whatever no, reason. No, and I mean they're not as good as they have been in the past. And I think that Columbus will really get to see can the Flames keep this up. Yeah. Because like even like when they beat Anaheim, Anaheim's not the same Anaheim that we've been used to either. So it, we'll, we'll see. Well, we're both thinking six points. I think six of eight is very reasonable, and you know that takes us right into almost the Christmas break there. Just as a programming note, speaking of the Christmas break, the 21st of December is when we record our next show after this one. So that will probably be released sometime around the 24th to 26th. And that'll be our last show for 2016. We're taking the week between Christmas and New Year's off. 
so we can all spend time with our family here at Fireside Chat, and we will return and talk about all those games in early January, probably the second or third. So we will have a week with no shows, and then we'll be back in January. So, Matt, let's uh, hope the Flames get at least six this week. Ideally, we'd get eight and keep this streak rolling, and that's going to be a heck of a streak if the next team after us is Vancouver because I think they can roll over them and roll over Colorado. And we could, if they can win this week and get all eight points, we could theoretically win all of December, I think. Yeah. It's doable. Well, I don't know about that Ducks game on the 29th, but we'll it's see. It's at home. We'll see. We, beat them, we spanked them last time in the Dome. Yeah. If well, they might Honda be a Center, little be annoyed worried. by that, so we'll see. It's not in the Honda Center. We have to win it, right? Yeah. All right, Matt. Well, let's uh, chat next week, and you enjoy this week of Flames hockey, and uh, hope the Flames keep playing well. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week, and uh, happy holiday season. Take care. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat. And to follow us on Twitter at fireside podcast, catch our show on the podcast channel at the hockeywriters.com. Fireside chat is licensed under a creative commons attribution, non-commercial share alike license hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.